Please pray with me. May God's grace and peace be with us this day, O Lord. May you give us guidance in your word. Help us each day to proclaim your loving word and to stand up for you, defending your good gospel. In all things, reassure us of our salvation through Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. The congregation may be seated at this time. You know, I see, I see a lot of different things in the world and a lot of different things as I go around. And one of the things that I have seen quite a bit in the last several years is a bumper sticker that is a blue and white bumper sticker. Maybe some of you have seen it. And it says, coexist on it. Have anybody seen that bumper sticker? Yeah, that coexist bumper sticker. Now, they change a couple of the letters in there in case you haven't seen it. And in the first letter, they change to what's called the crescent moon. That is a symbol for the Muslim faith, Islam. The next letter they change is actually, the, oh, I want to come back to that in a minute. But then they change the X to a star of David, or in other words, the sign for Judaism. The last letter they change is the T, and they change that to a cross. Now, coming back to the O, they make it a peace sign. Now, in that bumper sticker, uh, probably Rodney King said it very well, this bumper sticker is trying to get, a, get, a, get us to think, can't we all just get along? If you haven't seen this one, maybe you've seen the one that is also rainbow colored. It has a, it's, uh, instead of just being blue and white, it's white letters with rainbow across representing the LGBT community. If you're not familiar with that, an acronym LGBT is for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. Uh, so, and, but basically, both of these bumper stickers are giving the same message. A message of tolerance. A message of coexistence. And that is the message of our world today, isn't it? Tolerance. We should be tolerant of everyone, understanding of every person. That is the message that we're given as we, look at, uh, as we look around our world. We're told that we need to accept someone no matter who they are, where they are, what they do. And that if they want to live as they do, then that's their prerogative. The question is, can we as Christians coexist? Can we as Christians adopt this message of America, of our world. It's not new to America, to be honest with you. It already has swept across the Western nations throughout Europe, this message of coexistence. But can we, people of God, can we coexist? Can a Bible-believing Christian coexist? A lot of questions that we ask in the church have a yes-no answer, but I have to tell you, this one is one that is an unequivocal no. And it's not a no of hate. Because in our world today, the message has become that if you are intolerant, it's been equated to hate. If you are not tolerant, then you must be hateful. But that is a lie. That is just as much a lie as many of these other religions that are out there. In fact, as Paul was writing to the people of Galatia, he was very firm in his message. If you notice in Galatians chapter 1, he used some really strong language. Galatians 1 verse 9, if you go back there with me. <clears throat> As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Now the word he used there is the word anathema. And that Greek word anathema is a very strong word. In fact, it means doomed for destruction. Let anyone who preaches another gospel be doomed for destruction. Or even more bone-chilling to me, is those words set aside by God for condemnation. Paul would rather be someone be set aside for condemnation than preach another gospel. Those are strong words, aren't they? Those are words that today in our culture, they would be considered hate speech, wouldn't they? If you were to say, let someone who preaches Mus uh, the Muslim faith, let someone who preaches Judaism, let someone who preaches the Buddhism or Hinduism, let them be anathema, how would the world respond to you? No politician's going to say something like that. You probably won't mention it to your coworker. How many lawsuits have been written for those types of words? And yet those are exactly what Paul wrote. Now Paul was writing to a particular congregation. 
He was writing to the people of Galatia. And this fo- these folks in Galatia, they had been infiltrated by a group called the Judaizers. And if you've been to any of my Bible classes, we've talked about the Judaizers before because they seem to come up so often in the New Testament. But let me just refresh you. The Judaizers were those who were converted from, from Judaism to Christianity. But they hadn't converted all the way. They still wanted to hold on to that ritual. They still wanted to hold on to that tradition. They would not let it go. So much so that they made it part of their salvation. The ritual purity that was required before Christ must be done. The circumcision must be done. The food laws must be done. They were ignoring the words of Jesus that He alone is the way of salvation. He alone is is the one who brings eternal life. See, Paul was not alone in his writing here. As strong as his words were, he was not alone in what he wrote. If you noticed on the front of your bulletin this morning, I put a a verse from Acts chapter 4. These are the words of Peter. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. No other name. Peter and Paul weren't off base either because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There is no other form of salvation. But I think most of you are aware of that. Most of you are here this morning because you know that there is one message of salvation found in God's Word revealed to us alone. But many of us, we buy into this idea of tolerance. We buy into this idea that I'm okay, you're okay. We buy into this idea that we must keep our mouths shut because we don't want to cause offense. How many of us use that as an excuse? Well, I cannot offend my coworker. I cannot offend my family member. I would not want to hurt their feelings. How many of us make excuses for them and say, well, God, when He is ready, will change their heart. Or perhaps the one that is most scary to me is, well, isn't He the same God anyway? No. The God of Scripture, the God of, that is, He has revealed Himself in Scripture, the true God, is not the same God that the Muslims pray to. It's not the same God that even the Jews pray to. Because the Jews, they did not understand. They did not understand what it meant to believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. It is not the same God as the Mormons. And even as many moral good things they have done, they do not believe exclusively in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And Jesus is very clear on that. Unless we believe in Jesus alone, there is not salvation. Now I'm sure that these words maybe have even caused some of you to cringe because it does fly so much into the face of our culture. It does fly so much into the way we are taught and we are brought up. If you go to any school in the country today, you will see children, young adults being taught tolerance. You will see them being taught that We should respect all religions. We should honor all religions. But Paul reminds us, we are not seeking the approval of man, but God's approval. And again, I need to reemphasize this. Being opposed to tolerance is not supporting hate, nor is hating the opposite of tolerance. Because here, when Paul wrote to these people in Galatia, he was doing so in love. He was writing to these people, not because he wanted to stir things up, because he had any malice, but he was doing so because he cared enough for their eternal soul. He cared enough for the people that he had brought to Christ that he wanted to make sure nothing polluted their understanding. How much do you care? How much do you love your community? How much do you love your family? How much do you love our world that we live in? It's a little overwhelming, isn't it? Because we do know how important those words of the Gospel are. 
we do know how important God's commands are to us. Because we also, at one time, were those separated from God. We, at one time, were those who did not have faith. We, at one time, were those who were lost. And God found us. Now, sometimes, it's so much easier to just forget about that. It's just easier to let things be status quo. It's easier not to rock the boat, isn't it? Because when you rock the boat, sometimes doors get slammed in your face. Phones get slammed down on you. Sometimes when you rock the boat, people stop talking to you. Sometimes when you rock the boat, people don't like you. Paul, more than any of us, knows how much rocking the boat brought about the dislike of the world. Because isn't that exactly what eventually happened to him in his own death? Rejected by man, but not forgotten by God. It's hard to think that way. It's hard because it is so countercultural. In our culture today, we're promised that if we're tolerant, things will just work. But I have to tell you, tolerance is not working. Not if you're a Christian man or a Christian woman. Tolerance is not working if you are one who stands on your faith and stands on your morals and stands on your belief. As Solomon reminded us in our ladies' uh, Bible study this week in our Proverbs, if the righteous man slips, if he slides, well, that's polluting the water. And how fast that happens. How fast that happens that if we just uh, let things go, if we are tolerant, things aren't just going to get better. Now, like I said, this is not a message of hate, but a message of love because that is what Scripture shows us. Scripture shows us that true love is actually going to someone and showing them the truth of God's Word. It means going to someone and showing them the, the promise of the Gospel and that it is not just for those who sit in pews, but it is for all people. That promise of the Gospel God intended salvation for all people. And as people who have a heart for God, we are intended to reflect that message to others. We are intended to show that message of salvation to others and show, those, show others that love that God first showed to us. That love that found us while we were yet lost. While we were yet at wretched sinners. That love that, that reached into our lives and rescued us. We are meant to reach into others' lives and rescue them. But as long as we allow ourselves to be pushed back, as long as we fail to stand up, how will people hear? How will people know? How will people see that there is something greater? See, there is something that is beautifully unique about Christianity. There is something beautifully unique about this Word that God has given us, and that is that there is nothing that we do or can do but it's all what has been done for us. Every other religion, excepting none, requires something of its believers. It requires some work, some burden. Christianity, all has been done by Christ on the cross, making it uniquely beautiful. That is the faith we hold to. That is the faith that we stand up for. That is the faith that we cannot lose even in this chaotic world we live in. It is, a, it is not a message that is meant to be preached at people, but it is meant to be shared with people. It is meant for us to go, to be with our brothers and sisters, our, our friends and our relatives. It's a message that's meant to be shared as a gift. And not alone. But we are a community of believers. We are the people of God. There's not an I, not a me. There's only one who could do, bring salvation, but we are not to be islands out there on our own proclaiming the message, but with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, sharing God's love, sharing His mercies, showing the world a better way. Another proverb, and you can tell that Proverbs is on my mind because of this past week, but <clears throat> another proverb that we read in Proverbs 25 was, 
A gentle, gentle tongue will break a bone. Now that might seem a little strange to you as you hear it. Uh, uh, thank you, Joan. I know to see who are listening. So, <laughs> but uh, it's not literally talking about breaking bones there. But think about the hardest of hearts. Think about the person you know who is most adamantly opposed to the faith. Perhaps the, word, the way to bring them to the gospel is not to shout at them, not to be loud and obnoxious, and not to be mean to them, but it is maybe a gentle word. A gentle word of hope, a gentle word of comfort. comfort. A gentle word of prayer for them as they go through a trial, as they, as they are bearing with this world. Sometimes those gentle words, well, they're hard to speak because we get so fired up. But maybe those gentle words are those words that people need to hear. And those gentle words break the hardest of hearts. Because it was the gentle word of Christ to us that broke our hearts, our hardened hearts. It was the gentle word of Christ to you that broke your sinful heart. Because even if you don't remember it, even if your baptism took place before you remember your heart was hardened against God, but in, those, in the washing of holy baptism, the Lord made you his very own. Those gentle words, I love you. Those gentle words, you are my own. And those are the same words. Those same words of true love that we share with our world, with our nation, with our families, with our friends. So as we think about it, as we look at the world around us, where has the Lord placed you to show his love? Where has the Lord put you? Maybe, maybe you've spent some time in a hospital. Isn't that the perfect place to share your love with those who care for you? Maybe you are in the business world. Maybe that's the place where the Lord has placed you to, to live out your faith by not joining in the shenanigans of others. Maybe it's being at home, making that phone call to a friend, to someone you haven't seen in a while. Maybe it's, it is lifting up prayer for all those names that you see on our prayer list or other prayers that are out there. But see, the Lord, He has given us many different ways to share that faith. He has given us many different ways, and so there's not just one way but what he does tell us is to stand up for our faith. And when we think about that, when we think about the importance of standing up for our faith, do so in remembering that we are the Lord's. We are fighting, not for our own, not for what is ours, but for what is God's. We are standing up for what is God. We are going to war for what is the Lord's. And we are not warring against people, we are not warring against nations, but as Ephesians 6 reminds us, we are warring against the devil himself. But right there, we have the promise of God that we already have a weapon that will overcome him before he can even start the fight. And that is prayer. That is the power of prayer to stand up and to defend the faith. And not only prayer though, but to put that prayer into action. Not for what is ours, but for what is God's. So where are the people God has placed in your life for you to love? Who in your life needs to know that Jesus died for them? Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, in the world we live in today, there seems to be a message that is very much counter to your scripture. A message that celebrates all religions, celebrates all differences. And while you certainly have created us uniquely and wonderfully, you have told us that there is only one way of salvation, and that is you alone. Lord, may we stand up for that message of salvation. May we defend that salvation ever and each and every day. Lord, not for our own sake, not for the sakes of this world, but for the sake of Your people. Because on the cross, You died. On the cross, You, you gave Your life 
so that all people might have life. And from the tomb you rose, so that all of us might rise with you. Lord, may that be the message that is always on our hearts, and may that be the message that quickly is on our lips, that we may proclaim that good news, that you have redeemed us, and that you have given redemption for all. Lord, be with us now as we go forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.